Welcome to the Green Life Show. We're meeting here today on stolen Aboriginal land. It always was and always will be. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. QAnon, the Trump adjacent alt-right internet phenomenon that seems to have the power to encourage people to storm the Capitol building and has widespread adoption by political powers around the globe. Today, we're joined by John O'Milo, author of Dawn of the New Ugly, critical cultural researcher of our present society, streamer, and the most epic meme producer in my stream. Hey, John, how are you going? Hey, hey you guys. I uh, appreciate that, man. Shout out. To, uh, yeah, it's doing well. <laughs> Love those names, man. Uh, we have Alex Warnsborough, author of Capitalism and the Enchanted Screen. He's a critical media and screen analyst and lecturer in New South Wales. Hi, Alex. Hi. How are you? Great to have you today. Thank you. And Fred Fuentes, a prolific Green Left writer and editor who covers the current events of our society and the systemic causes that bring them to bear. How are you going, Fred? Oh, good, thanks. And uh, thanks for the invite to be able to participate today. Great to have you. Thank you. And I'm Dirk Kelly. I'm just someone curious about the cultural and material realities that we find ourselves swimming in today, the historical causes for their arrival and the potential impact they may have. Thanks for joining us on Green Left. So, Jono, could you kick us off with a bit of an idea about the roots of QAnon, sort of like where it fits in with other conspiracy theories? As far as, you know, uh, popular cultural, of, uh, as a popular cultural phenomenon, uh, as it sits today, um, it has its roots in a previous um, uh, conspiracy theory known as Pizzagate um, that started around uh, 2016, where um, it was like a set of uh, WikiLeaks um, emails that came from the uh, head coordinator for Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign during that time, um, and it's it's got it's got two points. It started off on um, this uh, online forum, which I'm sure we're going to talk a, a whole lot about, which is a four chan and eight chain uh, being like the uh, breeding ground for um, what would eventually end up becoming Pizzagate. But um, QAnon has this really interesting flair to it. Or it, it may have its roots um, in the, um, the the cultural sort of like beginnings of like Pizzagate, but it, it has this like really strange stew of like previous older um, uh, conspiracy theories, like the 1980s Satanic Panic. It also kind of has this flair of you know like a Illuminati sort of like John Birch Society sort of like uh, undertonings and leanings to it as well. And um, yeah, it's just it's just like a big mash. It's just like um, whoever the uh, the author Q is kind of just thrown has thrown like every conspiracy theory from like you know far right conspiracy theory from like the nineteen sixties nineteen seventies all the way up to today into like one big pot. That was a great uh, summary of of QAnon, and of course, what's interesting is the way that there's a few different aspects to the question about how we're mediated online. So um, I think often being online kind of can create a conspiratorial atmosphere anyway because you feel quite exposed and with social media it encourages you to think of yourself both as a consumer but in some ways also as a worker because you're posting this sort of content uh you, to audiences and so on so it sort of blurs the distinctions between commodity uh user and and even to some extent worker and so what happens is one feels kind of precarious and exposed and people are kind of commenting on you and, and, and clicking like and so on. And so I think this creates a sort of atmosphere of anxiety that might also feed um, into on, on, online um, conspiracy theories. But I think on top of that, there's also a way that that online media, um, because it's a shift from traditional mass media, where mass media is able to instill uh, standards and create sort of norms, you know, manufacture consent as the phrase that Chomsky uh, pushed uh, forward, you know, uh, in a way, digital media disrupts the ability to manufacture consent because what it does is it creates niches, right? And it does so because it wants to sell ads and sell products and cater to, you want, cater to your wants. But in so doing, it starts to change your thinking and your desires and your thoughts. So one video will lead on to another video that will lead on to another video uh, with autoplay on YouTube or something like that. And so it starts to make people more prone to radicalization. What's really interesting about for QAnon followers is that to some extent it, it, it brings together, as Jono said, all these different conspiracy theories. 
Um, and what's kind of interesting too is that you have the evangelical right wing conspiracy theory that's concerned about Satanists because the general sort of QAnon conspiracy is that the world is controlled by this cabal of Satanists um, who are, are into child pornography and want to molest children and so on. And, um, but, and that's the sort of general one. And that clearly marries with far right concerns about the sanctity of the family as well as far-right Christianity's anxiety around satanic panic um, and Satanists in control of media and culture. Uh, but then you also have, of course, that aspect also feeds into a sort of blood libel tradition of conspiracy theories uh, that were very anti-Semitic. And of course, George Soros is always a favorite figure of conspiracy theorists. And so they claim he's a sort of Satanist pedophile as well. And so you get that sort of neo-Nazi or right flavoring to QAnon. Um, and also there's also the fact that Trump's supporters had the problem of Trump wasn't actually taking on the elites. So they had to kind of invent a narrative by which Trump was taking on the elites, you know, because the conspiracy theory often holds that Trump is allied to Q and therefore is actually, or is Q, and is therefore actually involved in breaking up these satanic pedophile rings uh, behind the scenes. So he is working on our behalf. He's our ally, right, in this. That's the kind of right-wing mindset. But on top of that, on top of that, there's a weird, uh, more recent development where with coronavirus and concerns around health, concerns about well-being, and concerns about child safety, you have people who are sometimes, you know, anti-vaxxers becoming uh, part of QAnon and people who used to be center left, right, are starting to ease their way into QAnon um, as a sort of movement. And, and what we're seeing are people who are into QAnon, but also mindfulness sessions. So it's starting to take people who often might have left wing sympathies or center left conspiracies and pushing them to for far right. And so something like that, that sort of weird change and that weird manipulation of people's habits is actually very different to the way people's habits were um, manipulated through mass media that tries to strive for a standard, right? Whereas with QAnon, there's a level at which it's actually uh, managing to bring together different niches, you know, and it works through connecting different niches. And so that's kind of an interesting development with conspiracy theories that I think is fairly sort of novel. So following on from that, like it, this QAnon, it's a very online uh, conspiracy theory comes, as Johnny was saying, from the roots of, so these online image boards, 4chan, the likes of that. And it's definitely a new way of interacting with people in this sort of one-on-one -on -one social media space instead of this mass media way of, uh, as you're saying, like manufacturing sort of consensus. So Fred, I'd like you to get into, if you can, we have this online conspiracy theory, but conspiracy theories aren't really a new thing and QAnon isn't necessarily the, well, it definitely isn't the only conspiracy theory that we have out there in the world. What, how, why is it that conspiracy theories are able to take such power of people? Like, what happens in our society that makes them so um, effective at taking control of the discourse? I think it's a it's a really important question, and it, it really gets to the heart of how to deal uh, with the rise of conspiracy theories. Of course, the the, the traditional the traditional sort of response, or, or the, the response that most uh, mainstream media outlets. Uh, will say is that it's largely due to the things like the rise, rise of the internet. Um, it's largely due to uh, dark forces trying to spread uh, illiberal ideas uh, to bring down the established order. In some ways, creating their own conspiracy theories to explain the rise uh, of, of conspiracy theories themselves. Of course, they have a vested interest in presenting the rise of conspiracy theories in that way because it sets up the media as being the gatekeepers of the truth. You know, a lot of in, often, and I think it's important to start off with the, you know, this idea of conspiracy theories is often used in a certain way to put in the same basket really outrageous and crazy ideas together with ideas that have a semblance of, of, of reality um, and that need to be investigated more, but are labeled as conspiracy theories in order to really be able to put them outside of what can be accepted as uh, ordinary, as acceptable discourse. Um, so I think we should be able to differentiate, for example, the fact that conspiracies do exist. I mean, that, 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 is, a, that is a fact, because the fact of 
certain people getting together to conspire to carry out a certain plan uh, has existed all throughout history and, and continues to exist now today. That doesn't mean every conspiracy theory, therefore, uh, is true. And in fact, you know, it's probably more accurate to refer to these more as what we're talking about today really as conspiracy beliefs, because they're not really theories as such. In fact, the whole purpose is uh, to not rely on any actual evidence. The whole, the whole setup is, is done in such a way that the absence of evidence is the proof that the conspiracy is true, because that's how good the elites are. They, they've, they've not only carried out the act, but they've got rid of all the evidence. Um, and so only, only the enlightened can, can really understand, this, understand what's going on. Um, what we're really talking about is something more akin to you know, what we generally refer to as like religious beliefs. It's, it's not, not based on, it's not premised on fact, but rather on, on a deep seated faith. Why, why it's so prevalent today, I think has to do really with two, two important issues that have uh, really been deepening over the last 20 years. And it in part helps to explain why conspiracy theories have become more prevalent because it's not QAnon is new. Um, but we only have to go back 20 years to look at things like the, you know, uh, 9-11 terrorist attacks and the all, all sorts of ideas and theories that flew out from that. Um, everything to like it was an inside job uh, to, you know, uh, uh, jet fuel doesn't, doesn't melt steel beams. Um, and, and in between then and now, we've had many other, other theories that, that we could talk about. But I think what we've seen over these last 20 years and pre predating that is really probably two, two important factors that help to explain the rise of conspiracy theories today. I think the fact is a general sense of a loss of control around events surrounding us. And there have been some monumental events in the last 20 years, um, everything from things like the 9-11 attacks, prior to that, the fall of, the fall of, uh, of communism, um, if we go to present day, the COVID global pandemic, you know, all of these things are happening around the world. And there's a real sense that we, we have no ability to, to, to affect these events. So of course, one of, the, one of the ways to kind of deal with that, of course, is to come up with a theory that explains all that to you. Um, if you can find out, figure out something, particularly if it's a theory that removes any involvement of yourself in it or any ability to affect that change um, can have a very powerful impact. So, so that, that is part of explaining why we, we see attraction of, of conspiracy theories today. I think combined with that is a, is a sense of a loss of autonomy, a sense of the ability that we can influence. It's not, not only have, have are these big events occurring around us um, that we uh, have no say over, we, we can't have any say of it. We, we've lost any kind of ability to, to find agency. Um, I think th those two things, and that, and that again can also be explained by, but not by the fact that over the last 20 years, we've seen, or 30 years, we've seen the feet of the left, the feet of the trade union movements, the feet of social movements. Today just seems crazy to this idea that somehow people can collectively get together and, and you know, let alone change something small, change, change society as a whole. So I think these, these are important um, sort of uh, underpinnings of, of what is going on. I, I would add a third one, which, which you know, is explained or is part of all this, which is just a growing distrust with, with, with institutions, whether that be government or, or media as well. So it's not that conspiracy theories build that distrust, uh, that distrust exists. And so the conspiracy theories uh, are able to build off that. I think that's the important context for the rise of, not just QAnon, but th there are many other uh, conspiracy theories that uh, are not just on the fringes, but in many cases are, are in the center of media discourse. For, for instance, in, in many ways, uh, the way some media commentators talked about Russiagate as though it was an absolute beyond doubt that you know, Putin had uh, Trump in his back pocket. Uh, there was no, of course, no evidence for any, for any of that. Uh, there was evidence of you know, small involvement here and there, but that was not the way Russiagate was presented. It was presented as largely a conspiracy theory to explain why uh, Hillary Clinton lo lost the election. Um, and that was not on the fringes of the internet, uh, but that was in, in many, many, many media outlets. So, um, and had a lot of traction as well. So I think we, we start to see, if we understand what's been happening in society over the last 20, 30 years, we can understand why all these different ideas start to get uh, so, so much traction uh, and, and can't just be reduced to, oh, today we have the internet uh, or today there are dark, dark forces uh, somewhere in the background trying to sow distrust in our liberal society. Yeah, absolutely. I think something I want to dive into there, we've, we've talked about how it affects people and how we people are taken advantage of to, to join these conspiracy theories and give their energy to it. 
there are the actors that then take advantage of those conspiracy theories. So as you mentioned, Fred, you've got the mainstream media, the, the big news, taking advantage of the Russiagate conspiracy to push the Democratic Party's reasons for why it is they lost their excuses for why it is they lost their election and stuff like that. John, I'm, I'm interested, though. So QAnon, as this digital online conspiracy has a few aspects to it that are a bit new with a gamification sort of online aspect to it. And it seems a few people are taking advantage of it to to get something out of it on top of Donald Trump. I'm wondering if you can give a bit of uh, insight into sort of how QAnon is structured and some of the actors that it seem to be behind it. Uh, like I was saying previously, um, the uh, the roots of the uh, QAnon uh, conspiracy theory started on this um, online web forum called 8chan. And um, 8chan is sort of like this uh, sister site to uh, the uh, US uh, channel known as 4chan. And um, on, on 8chan, the way that um, QAnon has basically kind of like rooted itself in these sort of like uh, acrostic riddles and, and poems. And throughout each one of the, uh, the, the riddles of these poems, um, uh, people that were on the, on the website had deduced that um, you know, as Alex had said, and as Federico was saying uh, previously, that there is like this satanic cabal that is like ruling over the planet, et cetera. And there's just this sort of like magical, um, magical entity that um, that they're harnessing and using in this off-world sort of thing that's like taking place here. Um, uh, within that, that's that's like where um, you know it, it kind of ended up having like you know I, I guess you could say for lack of a better word like you know like a, a actual faces like you know real faces like people's faces started appearing to like align themselves with it as Alex was saying previously that it's like you know there's a bit of like online labor that ends up happening in order to like you know um, make the roots like sort of like bolster and like grow so um, well I guess we'll start with like a who like who owns 8chan like you know who 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 had created 8chan and it's this man named uh Jim Watkins and his son Ron Watkins um a, a lot of people have alluded that uh Jim Watkins and uh, Ron Watkins are like the actual like puppeteers like the voice of Q but it hasn't been completely you know it hasn't been really completely sort of like uh you know, set in stone that Jim and Ron are, you know, are the voice of QAnon, but there's more than enough evidence to show that it would actually be you know, Ron and Jim, like, i.e. one of the, you know, just to make a little bit of an inroad here, i.e. the fact that, um, you know, the the hexadecimal code that like eight channers and the people who uh, follow Q um, of each one of the posts um, decrypt in order to show the authenticity of the, of the Q, of the Q posts. Um, one of the only people that would have the ability to give that sort of um, a decrypting ability um, and sign in ability um, to Q would be Jim and Ron Watkins, the, you know, the web admins of the forum. So, you know what I mean? There's, this is a lot of questions like inside of that, whether or not it actually is Ron and Jim. Um, but, uh, but beyond that, um, there's, a, there's like a number of people who have financially like bolstered themselves from Q you know, like selling like Q and R merchandise and these sorts of things, making sorts of like you know, sort of mini documentaries, as Alex was saying, like previously, that like the YouTube algorithm sort of like uh, it pushes it, it that like it, it sort of like uh, uh, like makes this pipeline. Let's let's say um, into these sorts of like content, and then eventually you'll end up uh, you know at Q. Um, and, and then also, as uh, Alex was saying uh, previously, there's this uh, website. Sorry, excuse me. It's like the streaming service um, that ended up being like sort of like the uh, the playground for a lot of the people that are really deeply involved in the QAnon phenomenon, like such as like Jordan Sather. It's called uh, it's called Gaia.com, and it poses itself as like a wellness and like health sort of like left to center uh, website where it's like you know mindfulness and yoga and these sorts of things. Um, there was like a a failed author who uh, goes by the uh, online handle uh, Neon Revolt. And uh, Neon Revolt, he was like a failed like a uh, fiction writer and had used a lot of the tools and narratives that were given throughout the QAnon post to try to like bolster and create like a, like a branching narrative inside of QAnon in order for him to try to sell books on Amazon. So we, we see all sorts of people that can attach themselves um, materially to Q um, and, 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 a, and a bunch of in a bunch of different ways when it comes to uh, producing media and trying to become a face of it. But um, the the reality of the question is is um, Jim Watkins and Ron Watkins have been pulled into Congress 
for questions about nefarious activity on their website. Um, Jim Watkins and Ron Watkins, I know this is like a really strong call out, would be the ultimate people. They would be the number one people to tell us who QAnon is or is not, and they have not, they have not even inched towards the question uh, whatsoever. Um, my personal opinion on the whole situation is, is that um, throughout um, web forum history, there's been um, what people sort of know as like a LARP or like a live action role play. And there was like previous live action role plays on 4chan and 8chan as like FBI Anon, White House Anon, and so on. And it's, it's, yeah, within itself, I mean, this is coming from like a meme creator. There's sort of like these forced memes where like throughout um, different administrations, they all try to attempt to do like, you know, the same thing that like QAnon has attempted to do. Um, uh, if, if you guys are a fan of the Q Anonymous podcast, they had one of the um, older moderators of um, HN, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Brennan on the show. And he, he even talks about how... Um, um, on some of the uh, technology forums of 4chan and 8chan, he used to pose as like an Apple employee, like an Apple manufacturer, and try to like do these sort of live action role plays about like upcoming technology within, um, you know, Apple distributors and so on. So um, a, a lot of these things are all sort of like paired in the same way in order to try to not only like bolster anonymously, like a name for yourself as like a poster, but, you know, as we saw, you know, previously, like a, a name for yourself and selling merchandise or trying to sell yourself as some sort of a, um, uh, a guru in the space. Right. So there's this, this way to capitalize on it to, to sell, make money, make a brand for yourself. Um, and then I think there's, there's probably other ways of, of taking it to get power. Alex, are you, you able to talk a bit more of, um, I guess we've talked, we're going into the political reasons, the systemic reasons as to why they exist, but maybe talk to us a bit about the society that we're in and how it can be leveraged, like how these conspiracy theories can be leveraged for power. I want to actually answer your question by also synthesizing a point that Federico made and, and uh, John O has also made, which is, uh, you know, bring together two different points. One is that I think part of it, part of the reason uh, for, for popularity of conspiracy theories does relate to the sense that mainstream news media will often try to point toward conspiracy theories uh, regarding, you know, Russian hacking of the election, you know, in 2016. Um, there was that whole idea that the main reason that Hillary Clinton lost was uh, Russian hacking, right? Um, but it was down almost solely to Putin's interference and therefore in this sort of very neo-Cold War mentality, the Democrats pushed this narrative of Russia as the enemy invading state. Now, I'm not a fan of Putin, obviously, you know, I, I find him uh, repulsive and so on, but I think that was a big part of it. Um, that, that, that has pushed this sort of conspiratorial mentality on both sides. So I completely agree with that. But I'd also add the caveat that I also think the media fails to make sense of things because it is profit driven and ratings driven. So it wants to sensationalize, it wants to touch on issues, but in a very facile and very quick sort of way to grab sort of attention. Um, and part of what that means is that people then don't have an explanation they don't have anything to draw together all these threads so they have sort of opinions but without a justification for them right and what QAnon does drawing on what uh, uh Jono said is that it has an aspect of gamification to it where you have you know alternative reality uh games for example entail pieces of information uh being released and then the gamers have to decipher that information and it leads them you know, to, to, to kind of collaborate in a variety of ways, right? And so in a way, I think that part of that gamified quality about QAnon, and this is a point that's been made uh, before, um, is that people actually are brought together to try to work out uh, what the poster Q is saying with their cryptic messages. So there's this process of it being this sort of evolving narrative. Now, I'm not exactly sure to what extent we can say that it's fringe, because I don't know that we can really say nowadays that there is that strong sense of consensus that used to be. I think the consensus has started to crumble in a variety of ways from Trump's election, 
uh, in the first place in 2016, and, and of course the Brexit vote. But also um, now I know that there has been this attempt to return to stability and normality and so on. But I think that we're, we are starting to see politicians who are elected to who proclaim things like uh, to be QAnon believers, right? Uh, there are people who who, who are pushing uh, agendas in, in the main uh, to, to audiences uh, that were previously considered fringe, uh, but nevertheless are embracing quite far right conspiracy theories. We see this in Australia with Sky News, for example, pushing uh, doubt around climate change. Um, you know, Murdoch media has done this for a while, uh, pushing skepticism toward, uh, for example, uh, for COVID response um, and so on. So I think that there is a level at which adjacent conspiracy theories are being propagated uh, to massive audiences, but they're propagated in basically different modes. So one is through the old mainstream media format, but another is through those niche circles online, those niche sort of echo chambers and amplifying, you know, an echo chamber implies an amplification too, because the echo comes back louder and that's definitely present. But also, of course, there's also the fact that people are just sitting in front of their computers much more and they need something to entertain them, to give their lives meaning in a time with COVID and a sense of isolation and alienation as well. So as we're increasingly mediated by uh, screen media, we're seeking explanations via screen media. Yeah, ab absolutely. F Fred, um, I'd love if you could touch on that. How has COVID sort of amplified the conspiracy theory world and... And what, what changes are we seeing now in this new normal world that we live in? Well, firstly, in, in regards to the specific question about how COVID has um, impacted, in, in some ways, uh, COVID has acted like, a, like a, a super mega event that has created the conditions for the bringing together of so many different, different conspiracy theories because it, it really is an intensification of those uh, two trends uh, that I referred to uh, in the, earlier on. Uh, Firstly, um, the sort of sense of global events occurring that I just feel like, you know, just completely out of individuals' controls. And I mean, a, a global pandemic hasn't happened for 100 years, of course, is going to create that real sense of what, what on earth is, is actually happening. Um, combined with, uh, and, you know, this is certainly something that, uh, you know, uh, alt-right and, and conspiracy theorists, but not just them, have, have pointed to is the fact that, you know, states around the world have used this to in impose important restrictions uh, on, on people's liberties and, and movements. Now, obviously, there's not the space to debate the, the pros and cons of those, but all of this, you know, is, is the perfect fertile ground to, to, for, for conspiracy theories to, to all sort of merge into, look, this, this is the grand, grand plan we were telling you all about, you know, states around the world are literally locking people in their homes uh, under the fear of this global event um, that that no one really knows what it's about. Um, so I think that that certainly uh, has has helped to to, to propagate uh, you know conspiracy theories in in, in the last year. Um, I think also though it, you know and going back it relates to the the question that, that you asked Alex about how how is this sort of used not just or conspiracy theories not just used for monetary purposes, but also for, for political purposes. And I think there is an important aspect to that. If, if we look at the, the past three decades, you know, we, we see monumental global events that have occurred, um, the rise of neoliberalism, globalization, um, wars around the world, the global pandemic. We add to that the fact that over this period, we've seen the complete hollowing out of any political project of the main political parties, where today Labor Liberal largely stand for the same things. Yes, there'll be some policy difference, but for instance, both of them accept the idea that market forces rule the world, um, that really we, we, we as individuals, as political parties, as states can't really do too much. Um, ultimately, it's, it's, it's globalization has, will dictate uh, what, what happens to our, to our, our local economies. Um, all of this has, has, has really, and the fact that these political parties as a large result have, have lost their, their base, both on the right and the left. So you see all sorts of declines in their voter base and rise of new parties, some of which new parties use semi-conspiratorial thinking to, to, to explain their rise. And it's not just on, on the alt-right, but you'll find that on, on, on different leftist forces as well, who will use, if not conspiracy theories, cer certainly ideas or populist ideas um, that try to portray a um, 
an image of you know how how we need to co confront the elites uh, that, that that control the world today. So so we see in this context of where have people haven't been told there's no alternative um, that the you know that basically we have no no ability to control what what's happening. Um, you see how political forces are, are, are in many cases start to use it. And as I said, it's not just the fringe forces, but you even see how even mainstream forces are having to use elements of conspiracy theories to, main, to mobilize their social base because politics is being completely hollowed out. So it's not just Russia gate, but you even see that to a certain extent in Australia, you know, the, the idea that somehow um, Murdoch is the one that controls everything in politics. If only Murdoch didn't exist, everyone would somehow automatically vote differently in, in Australian politics today. Uh, you know, uh, when it comes to COVID and the, the, the response in different states, it must be because this state, because it's not my political party, must be lying or they must have done it on purpose to, to spread, the, spread COVID. Um, all, all of these things try to reduce politics down to, to individuals, to, to elites, um, but also have, have at the same time as being anti-elite, uh, I can also have a very elitist element in the sense of only, only I can understand that this is going on and everyone else who doesn't must be sheepy. You know, they must be brainwashed by Murdoch. Uh, they must be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, people who, who don't, aren't willing, really willing to, to follow the evidence. So political parties have seen this as well and they, use, they, they promote this. They may not do it openly, but they may do it for their through their trolls and bots on, on, on social media or whatever, because it's, it's, it's this attempt to try to regain some level, level of support. So we do see how political parties also try to mobilize this kind of thinking rather than actually trying to think through, well, how do we overcome this? You know, how do, you know, so while, whilst, whilst talking about the dangers of conspiracy theories, many of them will play into it and, you, and we see it through the way that they also use uh, our social media as well. So I think, yeah, that, that's a, a really, because I think, the social media aspect of the rise of conspiracy theories um, is an important aspect, but is, is compounded or is only truly understood by a parallel phenomenon, which is the real disintegration of the community and organization in the outside, in the real world. Um, so that is, whereas 20, 30 years ago, you could go to your uh, local sports club and spend time there. You could go to your trade union and have to discuss and debate real ideas with different people from different political traditions with, with different conceptions of how the world was run. Um, you could go to uh, a public, public hall events to discuss this. All, all of this has largely crumbled down and instead we're now reduced into largely living out our lives through, through social media, which as Alex has very well pointed out, isn't, isn't a neutral place where we all just come together there. We're, we're siphoned off into our little corners and we're only those that we already agree with are the ones that we discuss. So we find it for not, you know, so you will see it on social media. People would post, I, I can't understand how X party won the last elections. No one I know votes for that party. Uh, well, you know, it probably <laughs> says more about how social media operates than what's happening in the real world. But again, I get back to that point of like, the social, the, the, the power of social media is intensified by the fact that community, community organization structures have largely been hollowed out or, or destroyed, where they'd be trade unions, where they'd be community groups, um, where they even be things like, you know, traditional bowling clubs or, or whatever. Although COVID seems to show that at least in some places uh, in, in Northern beaches of Sydney, people still go to bowling clubs, but in a lot of, a lot of other, other areas, they've been replaced by things like poking machines, um, you know, totally individualized sort of a way of, of spending your, your social time. So I think that's, that's another important aspect and it, and it helps to start to uh, point us in the direction of, well, how do we really tackle the conspiracy theories? Is it just simply by putting fact checking uh, sort of uh, disclaimers on social media or is it by actually looking at what's happening in our world and how we can start to rebuild that that sort of community? Just extending on Federico's point there, that's that's really a, a great point because um, in a way what, what's happened is that people don't trust social media giants, understandably, because they know that they're being manipulated by them. So they're not going to trust the disclaimers. In fact, it kind of is annoying, if anything, you see. And what happened, as, as you said, is that... Um, there was this narrative during the Cold War that things were going to get better once the Soviet Union disappeared, that democracy was triumphant, that we were moving toward liberalism, there was that triumphalist idea of the end of history. Um, and then, of course, um, history continued to go. And if, if anything, because there was no uh, reason to move to more a more liberal and more democratic society, it seemed as though both parties came became closer 
in ideology so much so that there wasn't really much of a choice. And so then what happened was that, you know, basically it, it has this sense that finance has taken over, that there is no way of actually changing the world, right? Which is, is very disempowering. But then there was a savior of the digital technology uh, would bring us together. It would create a truly free, truly open, truly democratic society where anyone could post, where we could all get together um, in some sort of community way. And then, of course, it turned out that it was all secretly privatized, colonized, and so on. I mean, Facebook used to run for line on its sign-up page, but it's free and always will be until about 2019, I think, was when they changed that. Because people did wake up to the fact that, no, you know, everything is being manipulated. Everything is algorithmic. Um, but that just sows distrust, and it doesn't build that need for solidarity, for working together in collective interests or encountering people outside of one's echo chamber. You see, it just creates that realization of that we are controlled by corporate elites in and of itself, just creates a greater sense of a conspiratorial mindset because there's no sense of solidaristic structures, structures by which solidarity can be shown. We know that Trump especially benefited greatly from QAnon and, and the support that he received there. But here in Australia, I mean, we've recently seen the likes of uh, Craig Kelly, the white supremacist, uh, being uh, quite vocal and supportive of it. And, and I think in other areas in our, in our Western or in Australian society, we're seeing this happen. So does anyone want to talk on how Australia is being impacted by QAnon? I think there's a big question with the whole issue about Craig Kelly insofar as it's interesting to think about to what extent is he niche versus mainstream? Because obviously uh, he's, he's a politician that until recently was part of a major party, he, but he was a bit of an embarrassment for the coalition, right? Um, and he was viewed as fringe, right? Um, and so on some level, you could frame him either as kind of just a very stupid example of a mainstream right-wing type of narrative that climate change isn't as serious as people think, as, as the left is propagating, or you could say that maybe he has also been infected by the sort of conspiracy theories related to QAnon and so on, or that he's trying to find a, and, and cater to a niche audience, right? Um, that said, you know, and likewise, Pete Evans, you know, what's happened there to that celebrity chef who uh, seems to promote um, alternative lifestyle conspiracy theories, who shared uh, Nazi imagery on social media, um, you know, has he, has he been infected by these conspiracy theories? Did he always hold on to them? And was he trying to do influence in those directions? Um, or is it just that this is related to him trying to find and source a new or niche audience, right? Um, it's kind of becomes kind of uncertain there with these changes in media form. Uh, but also it's worth noting um, that in a very real way, uh, politicians on the right have used a lot of, uh, have tried to sow so distrust Right, and destroy any sense of solidarity through the culture war. So Sky News and right-wing media generally, because it's in their class interests often, will push this idea that there are cultural Marxists in our universities infecting them. Um, if we look at, for example, uh, Peter Dutton, you know, he's tried to sow distrust and create distrust of African gangs, uh, but he, what he calls African gangs in Victoria. You know, he claims that Victoria had all this problem with African gangs in a very racist way. He was sowing this sort of distrust. And actually, for far right people like Blair Cattrall, um, a far right leader in Australia, neo-Nazi, um, and um, I think his name's Neil Erickson is another leader for far right and neo-Nazi right in Australia have actually sought to capitalize on Dutton's comments. Um, and incidentally, they've also been given platforms on mainstream media uh, before, right? Uh, including on Sky News, um, Blair Control has. Um, and what they want to do is create another Cronulla riot Okay, uh, which again speaks to the fact that in the mainstream there has been a pushing of quite 
um, extreme positions, but under kind of center right guys, you know, and this is kind of what Tariq Ali has called for radical center, where for center will actually adopt very extreme measures, you might think about the detention of children, in offshore detention centers on prison islands in the case of Australia, for example. So there has been this push toward quite authoritarian right wing politics, but under centrist guise. Um, and so it's little wonder then that for far right, whether or not it's created by this shift, right? Going, well, why don't we go even further or whether it's capitalizing on it, but they're certainly trying to capitalize on this move toward for right, you know, and for move toward authoritarianism. They say, well, why don't we go a little bit further, right? So I think that's something to, to keep in mind. I, I would say in terms of when we're looking at Australia, um, so it, 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 it's interesting to look at, you know, what, why is it that we now have politicians or, uh, you know, as, as Alex pointed out, high-profile high chefs, um, you know, who are, 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 you know, entertaining these, these conspiracy theories. Now, it, it, it may be the case that they genuinely believe them. Uh, it may also just be the case that they see that there's some monetary or, or political value in that, at least uh, presenting these ideas while always, always maintaining uh, an element of, of distance. So it's, you know, quite often it'll be presented as like, well, this is an idea. I'm not saying I agree, but I'm not saying I disagree. You know, I'll, I'll let you, let you, let you to judge. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's, we, we don't know, don't know if it's genuine belief or, or just seeking uh, ad, advantage out of it. I think what it does indicate though, um, is that these, these people, and these people are not uh, unintelligent people. I mean, you don't get to parliament uh, by being a, a complete fool. Um, uh, uh, realise that there is a sentiment within Australian society that they can pay on. I mean, that, that's why they would do this, whether, whether they, if they genuinely believed it but thought there was no political mileage out of it, they'd probably keep these ideas to themselves and wouldn't be spending most of their time on Facebook. And for instance, um, you know, as a result of all of this stuff coming out about Craig Kelly, it was shown that his Facebook page had more likes than any other politician in Australia, including, including the Prime Minister. So obviously, they've realised that they, you know, they can get some advantage out of this, whether they believe in them or, or not. So then it comes back to the question of, okay, so we understand what, what you know, this fertile ground that exists, uh, in, not just in the US, but, but in Australia, in Australia today. And I think is an interesting thing, because and I'll take the, the, the uh, chance now to, to draw an issue that's been brought up before, that relates to this, which is the kind of how is it that so many of the wellness um, and sort of health sort of factors, uh, you know, you hear about all these, you know, different uh, yoga and Pilates instructors who seem to have over a night become, um, you know, the most fanatic MAGA QAnon so supporters ever. And I think actually in some ways it, it, it makes sense in two ways why this has occurred. Uh, and fits in with this sort of broader picture of what I've been presenting. Because actually, what's at the heart of a lot of this health and wellness uh, sort of uh, industry is this idea that you can regain control of your life. You, you may not be able to control the rest of society, but you yourself can improve yourself. Um, and then you see, this is a lot of the times what's at the heart of conspiracy theories as well. You can finally regain some level of control. And underpinning a lot of that is generally, you know, what's been described as um, and Jennifer Silver, a US academic refers to it as kind of forms of pain management. The reality is that a lot of us are living lives where we have a lot of pain, where we see the impacts that globalization, deindustrialization have had in have had in our communities, depending on she, she's talking more about sort of you know Midwest the United States, but you could see that here in here in, uh, in Australia today as well, in towns that have been affected by previous waves of, of sort of privatization or closures of, of industries. So there's a lot of pain out there. Um, there's a lot of sense of lack of control over, over daily life. Uh, and we see how all these two, these two different threads of right-wing conspiracy theories and, you know, what we're seeing generally as progressive health and wellness sort of crew have, have sort of merged together on this, this common sense of here's something that we can, we can hold on to, uh, to both give us a sense of why, wh what is our place in the world today, but also more importantly, in many ways, is a sense of comfort uh, in, in a society where that, that's so, so lacking. I would add to that, though, uh, that it's also compounded by the fact that in general, the, the left, and when I say left, I, I mean that the broad spectrum of the left, reaction has been the complete opposite, uh, of, rather than trying to understand the sort of the, the, the pain that many people are going through, is just the same, you know, essentially, and the clearest example of the response to that is Hillary Clinton's, or these, you know, half, half 40, 50% of these people are deplorable. Uh, they're just not even worth talking to um, because they have, have these different, different ideas. 
um, yeah, they're, they're just they're simply just told uh, if you don't don't accept our ideas, then you you must be wrong. You must think, you know, and in, and in many cases, uh, furthering the beliefs in their conspiracy theories by just turning around and saying, no, no, you've 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 got to tr like in the case of COVID, you you must trust the experts. Uh, when the, the whole premise of the conspiracy theory is that these expert, experts are trying to impose a new world order under the guise of, of a pandemic. Um, so I think there's, there's both of those aspects to when we look at Australian politics. It's clear people are realising, at least in a, an element of the political class, that the ground exists to, if not propagate these, at least give them some, some space uh, to see how that can be used for political or, or monetary economic uh, purposes. But on the other hand, there's a real inability to try to figure out, well, how, how do we grapple with this without just basically shunning, shunning these people off and saying that they're, they're, no, they're not, not worth the, the, the discussion anymore um, or, or leaving it to, as I said before, leaving it to Facebook to put a fact check on, on whatever they post on Facebook or, or calling for uh, big tech to, to shut down these accounts to, you know, so, you know, and at the same time presenting the corporate media as being the real gatekeepers of the truth, you know. So no one can be trusted on social media, but we should trust um, the, the, the corporate media uh, who, you know, as, as we've noted before, are, are, not, are, not, uh, are not afraid to propagate their own, their own conspiracy theories where, where it may suit their, their particular economic or political agenda. What do we do on the left to actually build those responses to it and not take an opportunistic perspective? I've seen people say, Oh, what, what can we do on the left to create our own conspiracy theories to like get people to realize, you know, like, so we don't want to be taking that opportunistic perspective. We want to be talking about actually building real responses. Um, I would say there's probably three things that we can do uh, constructive or that, that, that we need to do. I, I, I think the, the, the first is if we understand that quite often, you know, no, no, every conspiracy theory has a, a small grain of truth to it. It's generally a very minute grain, but it's no conspiracy theory is based on, you know, zero thing that's true. That's what makes it so powerful. You have that one grain of truth and from there you just go off. And as long as that one grain of truth is, remains true. So many of them, are, as we've talked about, are essentially about elites who, you know, have a lot of power in society today. Well, that, that, that does exist. They're not small groups of five or six people that, that have a meeting, but there, there are there is a class, a capitalist class who, or a political class who have a lot of power uh, in, in, in today's society. I think the first thing we want to do is avoid essentially a position where we side with that political class uh, and defend those institutions, those crumbling uh, institutions that have created this fertile ground for conspiracy theories to, to arise and say, no, that they, these, are, these are the institutions that we must defend against the the deplorables against the, the people who you know have have these crazy ideas. Um, that doesn't mean we we should uh, give any uh, credence to these ideas and that we shouldn't uh, uh, debate and, and, and attack these ideas. But but it, I think we'll find that nine times, much more times, that that person who believes in some kind of crack con con conspiracy theory is much more of our a potential ally uh, than those in the political class who are who are trying to tell you know trying to basically say or. Any, anything outside of the, what the mainstream media reports is just uh, outside ordinary dis, uh, acceptable discourse and should just be silenced and, and, and shut down. I think really to overcome this is overcoming the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, economic, uh, you know, and political underpinnings of, of the rise of, of conspiracy theory. So it's no, not gonna be easy work. It's not gonna be done by just simply fact checking. As I said at the start, these, we're, not, we're not really dealing in many cases with, with theories that are, you know, can be counterposed with a different theory like in science. And then, you know, once experimentation and facts are collected, you know, the, the, the correct theory is, is proven. These, these are beliefs. It's, it's just as hard as it is to convince religious people. And I certainly wouldn't advocate people go and spend all their time convincing uh, people with religious beliefs that have, that why their religious beliefs are, are, are wrong or why a different religious belief is, is more correct. I think the last thing we want to do is sit around and convince conspiracy theorists about, you know, why, why the facts show that, 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 that or everything in, in what they have to believe is, is wrong. I think all we need to do is work, work in really changing the, 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 that economic political underpinning. So what does that mean? We need to be able to rebuild community. We need to be able to rebuild organisation. We need to be able to rebuild unions where all of us can actually get back together. And these, these ideas can be discussed not through the confines of social media, which is set up to polarize and to create these sort of chambers where we, we just uh, either find friends that we all already agree with 
or just go in for war. And then whenever we decide we want to, we just leave and, and go away. You, you can't do that in real organizations. You can't do that if you've got a, a real union that meets every month and then has discussions and debate. You can't do that if there's co community meetings that, that are occurring, whatever form that they may take. So I think that's a really important part. I think that combined or linked to that, because a lot of these organizations will largely emerge out of struggle. So we've got to be able to work towards you know, collective forms of, of political action, uh, collective forms of, of community action where that can help to build the, these institutions. I think that's an essential part. It, outside of that, it's going to be extremely hard. Um, and, and so we need, we need to work towards that. I think the third thing that we need to do is to work hard uh, as, as the radical left of um, coming up with or, or forging a, a credible political alternative that helps to explain what is happening in the, in the world today. Um, a lot of people are looking for that. A lot of people want to fight. The traditional parties aren't offering that. As I said, most of them basically say, look, they basically accept the premise that there is nothing we can do today. Like we can, do, you know, we can lift the unemployment uh, benefits by $3 or by $5 or by $10, but market forces determine everything. Uh, you know, at the end of, you know, it, even when you look at the question of climate change, both major parties are largely just basically accept that market will decide what happens here. We can't really do anything about that, no matter how catastrophic climate change might be for the future of humanity. Uh, there's nothing we can do except for let the market hopefully, hopefully resolve that. We need to be able to present uh, a, a different political project that shows that actually it is it is possible a different different way of organizing society is possible a different way of dealing with the, the problems that we face today is possible and that, and that can't just be a sort of um sort of uh one element of it i suppose is what that future might look like uh, but it can't be just reduced to sort of some utopian idea of everything could be better because the reality is after decades of nothing changing and things getting worse, people may like your idea, but they're not going to believe that's possible today or tomorrow. Um, what they're going to believe is possible is, is, is very little to nothing. So we've also got to be able to figure out, well, what's a concrete political plan of action today that can start to shift us in that direction? You know, how can we concretely you know, present things? Uh, and I think a key aspect of this is democracy. That is our key uh, response to conspiracy theories is actually the democratization of institutions that exist today. So they can be opened up and become spaces of deliberation and decision-making. That is how we begin to really empower people. And once again, give them a sense that they have, even if it may just be at this local council level, but a sense of control over their local council. Um, today, the total absence of that uh, means that they seek it out in, in, other, in other places. What we wanna do, is ensure that, that that is channeled into actual the real a real empowerment, not not a, not a false uh, management of the pain that exists in people's society that helps to explain away the problems, but actually creates spaces where people themselves can deal with the problems that they face and be part of coming up with those solutions. So I, I'd say those are three things. You know, I'd put them out as as three things that we want to do. None of them are going to resolve the problems of conspiracy theories tomorrow. Uh, but then again, I, I'm not sure that we can. I, I think you know that 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 that. that the, 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 the political situation we're in means that we're probably in a, in a period where they're going to continue, continue to thrive. And as I said, when you've got conspiracy theories that are being driven literally by supposedly the most powerful man in the, in the person in the world, the US president up until recently, it just shows how deep these have infiltrated into, into a society. So it shows that we're going to need kind of broader societal change to really start to grapple with, with this issue. On uh, what we can do to try to like a, to provide some sort of relief or at least some sort of like pathway, like a way, you know, uh, culturally um, and mentally for people away from conspiracy theories. And uh, I just wanted to point um, there's like a, a a lot of the the research around it, especially like, you know, not to bring it back into like a U.S. context, but uh, I just wanted to just ground this a little bit with, you know, with a little bit of a, um, a, a little bit of fact here. Um, uh, 60%, almost up to 60% of uh, US citizens believe in some form or shape of conspiracy theory. Okay, if this is anything from aliens to JFK to like I said, to satanic panic and on and on and on. So as Frederica was saying uh, previously, this is like the, this is looking at, at media as a commercial enterprise. And 
you know, uh, bolstering and trying to, to profit, you know, uh, from that, you know, which is like, you know, made like, you know, a, a pathway into more radicalism of, of the right. But then um, also, this is, again, as Fred was saying, this is the absence of community. You know, uh, this is like people being siloed away within these uh, cultural ideas and then not really having like a place um, to educate themselves or to like see another human face and like bounce some of these, like, you know, uh, some of these conceptions off of. And we need to be, um, uh, we need to be some of the people that provide some of that in some way. You know, I know that like, and like I said, this is like a, I'm a very like online leftist, you know what I mean? Like dunking, dunking on your uncles, you know what I mean? And going around on Twitter and lambasting people for believing in Q and this sort of thing is just strengthening the silo. As Alex was saying previously, it's just making the echo come back louder when you you, you denigrate and you do these sorts of things with, with folks, you know, and about these ideas. So, um, you know, like, I, I, I'm not a trade union person. I don't know how the internal mechanisms of that sort of stuff is, but I do spend a lot of time like within culture. And I know that culture can be, um, you know, empathetic, you know, uh, imagery can help, you know what I mean? And like I said, uh, just having like a human face and just human interaction on these sorts of things can pull people away from it. And as Fred was saying previously, it's not, uh, it's not the ultimate, you know what I mean? It's gonna, it's gonna take time, you know? Um, as we're, we're speaking right now um, on, on 8chan and a lot of the other alternative sites like Parler and now on Telegram, this encrypted uh, messaging site, they're already talking about like having like a new narrative for Q right now as we speak, where they're talking about like Q is supposed to have some sort of, just some, I don't want to go into it because it's like, it, it's gobblegook, it's psychobabble, but they're, they're even trying to set up for like a, a new date coming up into March that things are supposed to like happen. You know what I mean? I think it's like March 4th or April the 4th or something like this. So it's like, as Fred was saying previously, there's still they, there's still a thread inside of it. You know what I mean? Because it has this religious magical thinking that like, you know, the, the outcome that you want um, through like your individual, just like your posting and et cetera can bring about this reality. And we, we need to, um, bring people back into a space where it's like, no, community can do this, solidarity can do this, you know what I mean? And, and you're, you're posting in YouTube videos and, and monetizing QAnon t-shirts, or it's not the, it's not the way, like uh, enterprising media is not going to be the way that uh, solves this. That's a fantastic point to make on this podcast, <laughs> so we put together this video. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I love it. I love it. You know, like we're all pretty online people here, but I, I think also trying to, to get involved in those community actions. And I think that's a big push to what we try to do in all of our efforts here. Is I wanted to address um, Federico's point. I, I maybe slightly disagree with him ever so slightly. I love I loved your argument, Federico. Uh, but the only point that I'd slightly disagree is when you said you can't make utopian promises because people don't um, believe them. I think the only people who don't kind of believe in utopian promises right now are for centrists who are already living in their own utopian bubble. What I mean by this is often when people are at their most cynical, they're also at their most susceptible, right? Often people will think that they're hard to be fooled because they're cynics, but then believe a whole range of uh, incredible nonsense. Okay? Um, and I actually do think that there are cases where people, as you also made a great point, people who believe even in the alt-right and the far-right can actually be reached and brought over to the left and often will go to the radical left. So, for example, there's a YouTuber called ContraPoints, or actually her name's Natalie Wynn, uh, but her channel's called ContraPoints. And a number of people who were neo-Nazis have actually claimed that seeing her videos moved them to the left, right? People who were in incel communities, right? So incel stands for voluntary celibate. celibate. Uh, it's a mostly male community of guys who can't get laid to put it bluntly but who often have a really destructive ideology behind this and have actually killed a number of people there's almost like an incel shooting every year right um at least one so so it, it you know she has been able to reach them and she's done it through what she calls the aesthetic uh but but she is able to engage them in argument take kind of not necessarily take their concerns seriously but address their concerns and she does so in this kind of aesthetic way she she puts on different costumes and stuff like that now i'm not suggesting that we we, we do that obviously you know that that appeals to particularly people online but we shouldn't deny the aesthetic component 
to ideology. As Marxists, we often want to deny the aesthetic that much power because it can seem immaterial, but the aesthetic actually speaks to the senses and the body, and it's part of our material reality is how we see and how the world is mediated. So we shouldn't ignore the aesthetic. It's just that we need to uh, put this the aesthetic at the service of putting people uh, back into the community, uh, back into real world spaces, to move them away, as Jono was saying, from the computer, right? And to get them to engage with the world. Um, and that can, can be done. And often people who actually did believe in some way in Obama, right? Who did believe in the promises of Obama, right? What did Obama promise? Hope and change. He never really defined what hope was or what change was. And uh, for liberal centrists believe he kind of delivered on those two things, right? Uh, because what he did for them, what hope and change was, was a change of government to the Democrats. And one of the QAnon uh, protesters uh, who died famously in the um, Capitol insurrection, she had voted for Obama previously. And a number of people who voted for Trump also were Bernie Sanders supporters and would have voted for Sanders had he been uh, for nominee for the Democrats. And that's because Sanders was able to channel their frustration and their resentment at elites. And we do need to speak to that resentment, that feeling of resentment um, and that desire for something much better very different to what we currently have, right? And we need to take that resentment as well as that hope and bring them to making material changes because, you know, at first it'll be abstract, right? At first for them it will be abstract. And often I found this too um, from my own personal experience. But when you start to become part of an organization, you start to realize your power as an individual to contribute to something more because the collective and the individual are not opposed in the abstract way that the right insist, right? You only get individual rights through collective bargaining, through collective action. You don't start off with individual rights. Rights come from collective action. That's why there are at least some in every sort of so-called democracy, there are at least some rights on paper for the citizen. Um, you know, and that came from collective activity, collective struggle, uh, but there are no rights online, right? You don't have a right to your data. You don't have a right to your privacy. You have absolutely no rights. And the reason for that is that uh, people haven't realized enough the power of collective action to win those rights. Well, thank you all so much for your time. It's been fantastic to get into this topic. I know that it's very deep and we've not had anywhere near enough time to touch on everything, but I really appreciate all perspectives here. And and I hope that we can all continue working towards changing the real and uh, creating material conditions that mean that people don't have to fall to, to these conspiracy theories to heal themselves from the pains that have been inflicted by the society. You can support Green Left for as little as $5 a month. Join us at greenleft.org.au and don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel and hit that bell.